Hi, I'm Adam Mabo Ajayi, an eighth grader from Edinburgh Middle School, coming to you from Oakland, California. Welcome to the Town Talks, the show where a panel of students from Oakland talk to Oakland icons about all things Oakland. We are here to discuss the past, present, and future of our amazing town and creative solutions to the issues we face. We'd like to thank Edinburgh Middle School Family Engagement Team, Sixth Grade Humanities Department, Oakland in the Middle, KDLL, and our host, Richie Nunez. Our guest today is a world-renowned artist and former Minister of Culture of the Black Panthers, Amory Douglas. Take it away, Mr. Douglas. I'm delighted to be here this evening uh, to share this uh, brief presentation that I'm going to do in conjunction with our interactions with each other. Uh, this is the first image. Uh, this is when the Black Panthers Party started, October 15th. Uh, 1966 in, in Oakland, California. It was started by Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton, who were the co-founders of the Black Panther Party together. Uh, note, in 1968, the name was changed to the Black Panther Party because they had a 10-point platform and program, and it started around point number seven as the urgency and the necessity, ne 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 excuse me, ne necessity at that time. Uh, uh, point number seven, we wanted immediately end the police brutality and murder of black people. So, but in 1968, we began to begin to focus on different programs and social issues. So the name was shortened to the Black Panther Party. Here are some of my early uh, images I remixed. This is one out of all of our different survival programs. We had people free health clinics. We had free breakfast for children. Uh, in the mornings, uh, we had the people's free food giveaway. We had uh, school alternative schools. We had uh, education liberation schools. We had a free busing to prison for those who had family members who may have been locked up all across the country where they could go visit them for free. They just need to know where to come each week and they could get a free ride. We had a, a, an ambulance, a real ambulance service in Winston-Salem, North Carolina because the ambulance would not come into the community in a uh, proper time. So the Panthers wouldn't got certified and the community helped them by an ambulance. So we had an actual ambulance service in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This one over here is one that says Turtle Island, North America, Indigenous Territory. That's the uh, original caretakers of this land called this, the American Indians named this Turtle Island this whole North America that we call the United States and Canada uh, in the area where we uh, live is on the coast uh, in, in, in relationship to Turtle Island. Here's one dealing with issues of I'm, I'm food insecure, I'm homeless. It's trying to bring attention to the concerns that we have then and we have them also today. This one says, don't support the greedy, support the needy. And here we are talking about supporting the needy. This one here deals with, uh, here we are living in the land of plenty while we the people starve. This is a, a, a graphic that deals with our free food giveaway back in the day when we used to give uh, many bags of groceries away to the community for free, uh, that we would get food donated from the different stores in the community all across the country, wherever we had branches and chapters of the Black Panther Party. Here's one dealing with called freedom. That's here's left to what the struggle is about. Freedom. This is dealing with the word reparations. Reparations is dealing with slavery. Coming here against our will, being brought here. And this is the image using that word to bring attention to the reparations movement that's going on today and continues. And this is at the San Francisco MoMA right now where young people and everyone can go see it, uh, a, a wall mural and, and that I remixed and redesigned and some young artists uh, uh, put it on the wall, uh, reparations again. This is in Oakland, California on 26th between Broadway and Telegraph, a little narrow street just before you get to 27th. Uh, and this is uh, Free the Land. 
in solidarity, artists in solidarity with Palestine. You had a Jewish American artist. You had an Afrocentric artist. You had uh, also you had a, you also you had um, a Japanese American artist, Asian American, myself. That's my contribution, as you see. You had indigenous artists. So you had many many ethnic diversity of people who contributed to this project. This is the most recent uh, issue of when Haiti, Haitians were trying to c come into this country because of the devastation that's taken place in their country by their government in conjunction with this government, the US government. And so they're coming trying for a better quality of life and what have you. And here you, this, show, this was a famous picture that I reinterpreted uh, for that to show they're treating them like they were slaves or cattle being rounded up when they tried to cross the border into Texas. Here again is another one dealing with uh, today, young people going into the prison system don't realize it's about modern day slavery and it's about profit. Here's one that says Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter Justice. This is one is dealing with the immigration issue again, when families were being separated in prison, babies and taken away from their mothers and their fathers and separated and still are today in many cases. And I call this one ice cold wickedness. And I call it also made in the United States. These are the five blood Spike Lee's milk film, it Netflix film. This is an online design poster I did for the PR for the that film when it came out. This is also one of their uh, PR posts for the, uh, excuse me, for Judas and the Black Messiah, which was also I uh, designed in conjunction with other artists uh, for uh, online PR as well. Here we are talking, here we go again, talking about fossil fuel. Fuel, we talk about global warming. And, the problems that we're having, rain, storms, just a couple of days ago, now we have sun shining, and maybe just even tomorrow it'll be freezing cold again. So it's cause of global warming. So maybe young folks can be investigate those who may not be aware what fossil fuel, why fossil fuels plays into the turbulence that we have in the world today. Here to the right is little people against colonialism. That means being governed, not having control of yourself and your country and where you may live. For example, like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has no voting rights, but it's considered a part of the United States. But its people are controlled, have no no rights to, in many cases, to decisions that are made in their country are made by the United States of America. So this says, I am we in solidarity in the sense Mother Earth, here's showing what the problem with today in global warming. This is like the doomsday clock. They talk about it in the context that we're about two minutes away from the doomsday of no return in relationship to ice, the glaciers melting. Islands will no longer exist that people live, inhabit and live on in the next 10, 15, 20 years or even next five years. Here again is dealing with issues. This is also a remix of the image that I've reinterpreted many times in various ways, but I felt in, uh, strongly about reinterpreting it in this way, dealing with the issue of global warming. And the same thing here to the right, as I mentioned, you got the, on, well, you got the extreme weathers going from the sun to the glaciers ice melting and flooding, and all these things are taking place. This was also says, respect Mother Earth. This one says, all power to the people. And this is the brief show that I've, I wanted to share with you this evening. And maybe we perhaps some things you may have to mention or uh, more to talk about regarding the the show itself 
please feel free to bring them up in our conversation. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Mr. Douglas, for your wisdom, uh, for your generosity. Uh, my name is Richie Nunez, and I am the host of the podcast La Segunda. Uh, this past October marked 55 years since the founding of the Black Panther Party in Oakland. And I wanna say what an honor it is to facilitate this conversation between Mr. Douglas and this panel of students from Oakland Unified School District. Uh, students from Edna Brewer Middle School and Oakland Technical High School have prepared questions for this discussion. Uh, before we begin, let's have the student panelists introduce themselves and say their first and their last names, their grade, and what school they're from. Hi, my name is Gabby Kirsch. I'm in seventh grade and I go to Edna Brewer Middle School. Hi, my name is Zuri Bintalib and I'm in the sixth grade and I go to Edna Brewer Middle School. Hi, my name is Emma Bojai. I'm in eighth grade and I go to Edipur Middle School. Hello, my name is Koyo Tena and I'm in eighth grade and I go to Edinburgh Middle School. Hey, my name is Christopher Soriano and I'm a freshman at Oakland High School. Students, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, we have three topics to discuss. This is meant to be an open conversation. So Mr. Douglas, uh, please feel free to ask some questions and students also, please feel free to respond from your own experience. We wanna be mindful and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. First, we'll talk about your history, Mr. Douglas, in Oakland with the Black Panthers. Next, we'll discuss your creative process, how your ideas became art or how they become art. And finally, we'll end with issues facing Oakland today and the broader impact of the Black Panthers and your art on the world. Audience, Students listening at home, if you have any questions about any of these topics, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Let's get started. Gabby, why don't you start, off, start us off with the first question? Okay. Why did you choose to come to Oakland and um, why do you think the Black Panthers kind of originated um, in Oakland? And uh, Mr. Douglas, I just want to make sure that uh, you unmute yourself. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, 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 thank you for your question, Gabby. Uh, I, I, I was originally came to San Francisco where I lived. And then I heard of the Black Panther Party and I joined the Black Panther Party. And then I moved to Oakland, California. Uh, that was how I, my involvement in, got in with the Black Panther Party it was from being uh, involved in the in the social justice movement of that time during the 1960s. Uh, you had some of the same kind of issues and concerns that you have today. Uh, uh, police murders and being justified, high uh, high levels of uh, 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 institutional racism, also uh, the lacking in and in relationship to quality of life issues like housing, quality of life issues like uh, education, all those things were a part of the concerns that we were trying to confront during that time. I hope I answered your question. If not, please let me know and I'll continue to and Zuri, uh, you're up next as far as uh, any uh, question that you want to follow up with. Um, that was a, a good question. That was a good uh, question that Gabby asked and a wonderful response. Um, I actually have a question that kind of would involve to Gabby's question. Um, why did you stay in Oakland? I mean, I know that you stayed for the Black Panthers, but I and also why why did you stay? Well, I, I stayed in Oakland for many, many years. I lived in Oakland for over 20 years. The only reason why I came back to San Francisco was because my mom had bought a house here while I was in the Black Panthers. And so I came back to help them when they were elderly and I kept the house and that's why I'm here now today. If not for that, I would more likely still be living in Oakland today. Um, so yeah, in that, in that context. So I, that's why, why I, I, Oakland 
uh, was uh, a, a place where there was a, a, a community, people kind of communicated, looked out for each other, talked to each other. There was still that like community vibrations in the neighborhoods and where we operated and uh, were work and did community based work. So it was it was uh, uh, it, it was uh, the dynamics of being one with the community and those and understanding their needs and and the request of, of concerns that they had. All that was very important in relationship to as opposed to maybe living in other places outside of uh, Oakland itself. Thank you so much for that response, Mr. Douglas. Um, I know that we have Mevo uh, that is supposed to be going next, but she actually just, it looks like is going to be joining in a little bit. It looks like she just jumped off. So Koyo, we're actually going to uh, jump to uh, a question over uh, from you. Uh, well, I had a question, but I would just like to say that that was a really, like, I really enjoyed listening to that answer and the question. Um, well, my question was, uh, how do you use your art to change the way people think about these sort of issues that are happening in our world today? Well, the art, I have to first be understanding the needs of the community, what their concerns are, and interpret and reflect that in the art itself, uh, particularly in the art that you've seen uh, that I just the first part of the presentation. Uh, art like that I did in, in also in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, it's like the people see themselves in the images. And they put them, then therefore they become the, the performers and actors in the art and they can better identify with it because it's not divorced from that reality of what they're confronted with. But also we develop symbols and characters like the pig drawing and others that transcended cultures and identities in relationship because the commonality of the issues and concerns that transcended uh, communities in that way. And so the art became uh, an inspiration beyond just the African-American community. It became an inspiration for many diverse multicultural identification because of what it symbolized in the art itself. And uh, Christopher, feel free to jump in. And so before I begin, I just want to say that uh, Mr. Douglas, your art is absolutely beautiful. And for my question, how did Oakland impact you as a person and as an artist? Well, I think it, 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 it impacted me in the sense of being in the Black Panther Party. We have been living, as we evolved, we, we worked together, lived in collectives as we evolved and grew together. Uh, we not only did political work and social justice work in the community, but we also have to help cleanse and our own and bring up, uplift our own selves and how we work with each other and within the collectives. So that was very important uh, uh, in relationship and being able to work with limited material, uh, access to materials that we had to work with, using what we had to get what we needed to do. And so uh, that was important as well. And so it, nothing, we, we didn't allow the, uh, having a minimum amount of of, of access to materials or, or monies. We didn't let any of those gains get in, interfere with our desire and our determination to do the work that had to be done in order to serve the, uh, the interests of the community. For example, when we first, we had the first breakfast, free breakfast, and the school kids in the morning, we used to get up at uh, six, we, my, that, that, we used to get up two or three in the morning with the and fix, fix the breakfast before we to have it at, at the locations where the breakfast were going to be served, along with the community, those who in the community who supported us with families and mothers and brothers and fathers and what have you, sisters would come in and help with the breakfast in the morning, so that they would be prepared. So, and. By doing those programs, it became an inspiration and seeing the constructive aspect of how it was improving the spirit and the quality of life of young people 
you had many of the vendors in the stores who began to want to even donate more to those programs, you see. Yeah. So I think in that way, the spirit of Oakland was, uh, that way, it, uh, the spirit of Oakland was something that was inspiring, inspired with uh, uh, the support, the, the, the grassroots support that we had for the, all the types of things that we were doing during that time. I see that uh, Mevo just joined us. Uh, I'm actually going to give her a couple of seconds to think about her question. And I'm actually going to jump in, Mr. Douglas, and ask, yes. how do you make that type of passion, that type of activism sustainable for yourself? Well, you mean, if it's been over the years, it's just uh, a part of life's journey. And more so than, so it's, and you uh, carry on the, through the out, the constructive evaluation of, that we did, seeing the positive impact of the what we were able to contribute to the broader movement that was taking place, and for quality of life, I think that that helps you sustain through that that this is still uh, a reality that continues today, and it's not necessarily trying to duplicate what took place 50 years ago, but trying to deal with in the context of now and what needs to be done at this moment in time which is reflected in the artwork as well. Mevo, did you have a, a follow-up question you wanted to ask uh, in regards to uh, Oakland and uh, Mr. Douglas's work? Um, yeah, I don't know if this is already asked, but how did you find the Black Panthers? Oh, yes. Well, I, I, I went to City College of San Francisco uh, I had been in the black arts movement during that time, and uh, I went to City College of San Francisco during the uh, time when there was the black conscious movement in the United States, when you had African black people beginning, who we were defined, given the colonial name of Negro, and young people were beginning to resist that name, that negative name, and we began to define for ourselves as African, African American, Afro American, black, and what have you. And so there was this whole black conscious movement that was taking place in, 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 in the United States. And I was involved with, and it, which was during the same time when, like today, you had the George Floyd murders, Breonna Taylor murders. Same thing was taking place 50, 60 years ago. So young people like yourselves and a little older were trying to figure out what we can do, how we can help solve those issues. And so what happened is I had been involved with a group of young men and brothers and sisters. And one of them came to me and said that they were planning to bring Malcolm X's will to the Bay Area to honor her. I had been in the black arts movement and they knew of my doing work in the black arts movement. And they wanted me to come to the meeting to do the poster for that event that they were planning to bring Malcolm X's wife, Sister Betty Shabazz to the Bay Area to honor her. When I went to the meeting, they said there would be some brothers coming over next week to the to that meeting who would decide if they would do the security for that event or not. And when they came over to that meeting, that was Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. This is er, this is early 1967. I became involved with the Black Panther Party about three months after it started around late January of 1967. And so what happened when they came over after they agreed that they would do the security for the event, I, after the meeting, I asked them how I, I talked to Huey and Bobby Seale and asked them how I could join. They both had business cards then and gave me a business card. And so I used to call them and make arrangements to come over and connect with them. I didn't have a car, so I used to catch the bus over to Oakland to Huey, Huey P. Newton's house. And then we'd go, he'd show me around in the neighborhood introduced me to folks in the neighborhood. Then we went by Bobby Seale's house. And that was my first introduction into the Black Panther Party. This is around late January or early February of 1967. And so that became my direct first involvement of transitioning into the Black Panther Party. I'm actually curious to know, did, did you know what it was did you all know what you were doing like did you know that this was going to become the black panther party as we know it now no not at that time i don't think i think that maybe you and bobby were many many light years ahead of a lot of folks 
when they were always had been in debates and at the Seoul Student Advisory Committee over there at Mary College and what have you. And so, but like myself, uh, I just was one, I'm, this is on the job training for all of us. You know, we, ha we didn't have 50 years of experience. So we learned as we evolved. And, but at the same time, they had some insight and wisdom because they also had developed early on an advisory committee of middle-class blacks who supported them. One of them was Ruth Beckford, who was the well-known dancer who I remember they used to bring her over to, to the newspaper when we were just working out of a studio apartment, the LGP studio apartment in San Francisco. And they would be talking about showing what we were doing with the very limited materials that we had. Her and her, her, and her buddy, and, and they would come over with her at that time. And so um, af after that, uh, she, and she was a part of, and she was on the advisory list, Ron Dellums, before he was a congressman who was a state representative, then was on the uh, on that advisory advisory list. Uh, so your Dr. Reverend Pinkert, who has the church over there, was on that was on that uh, advisory committee list that they had during that time. So they had this whole vision, uh, Hugh and Bobby did. But you know, going fast forward, it was in April when they started the newspaper. And the first paper was of, of 1967, about April of 1967. And the first one was a legal size sheet of paper typed on a typewriter. And it was about this young man who had been murdered in Richmond, California named Denzel Dow. And it was helping the family get justice. And it had Elbert Big Man Howard, who was then the first minister of information, was now working in another capacity, that's why they would try to recruit elders to come work on the paper, because they knew of him as a writer in prison when he had, before he had got out. And so what happened is that elders, and there was a place called the Black House that had begun for prop up in San Francisco, where a lot of cultural activity used to go on. And Marvin X used to live and do the cultural things downstairs. Elder Cleaver lived upstairs. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale used to come over all the time to try to connect with elders upstairs because they want they were trying to recruit him to work on the newspaper as the minister of information and so i remember going by there one one weekend one day and elders and huey were downstairs there were no activity going on and when i seen bobby working on that first issue of the newspaper i told him i could help him to improve the quality of what he was doing because I still had materials that I did in graphic arts at City College of San Francisco. And so he said, okay. So I went home and came back. When I got back, he said, well, we, you, we finished with this now, but you seem to be committed because you've been coming around. This is February, this is April. I've been around, hanging around for four or five months, four months now. They said, we have, we're gonna start the paper and we want you to be in, we, we're gonna tell our story from our perspective. It'd be like a double-edged sword and can praise you on the one hand and it can criticize you on the other. It also, we say we, they had the whole vision that we have the paper going to have, if we can't have big headlines, uh, photographs and art in the paper. So because the community was not a, a reading community, but they learned through observation and participation. And it felt that those who weren't going to read the long drawn out articles in the paper could get the gist of what was going on by seeing the photographs and seeing the artwork and the captions in the, in the headlines in the newspaper. And it said, you, you will be the revolutionary artist, which became, was my first time. You will become the, you will be the revolutionary artist. And eventually you become the minister of culture, which became the title that I have now as been was the minister of culture in the Black Panther Party. So that was my first development and phase of development going into and working on the production of the Black Panther newspaper. The first tabloid issue of the Black Panther Party newspaper was the first issue that I contributed to. Absolutely amazing. And I see here, Gabby, actually a follow-up question uh, from Ahmad that I, I'd love for you to read off. And I also see uh, some more questions coming in the Q&A. Just want to encourage our audience, uh, please drop questions in the chat in the Q&A. We're going to try to get to um, all of them that we can. Uh, Gabby, why don't you go ahead and ask uh, Ahmad's uh, follow-up question in the chat there if you see it. 
I actually uh, can't. And if you can't, there's no worries at all. I'm happy to read it for you. Uh, yeah, could you? It's like, yeah, it says yeah. here, to follow up on Gabby's question on joining the Black Panther Party, was there anything in the party uh, you disagreed with? Well, you always, you, 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 you grow, you know, that well, we, we weren't different in those than people who came out of society. We were, we were, we came from the same society with the same attitudes and same personalities and same differences and stuff that we had, we brought into the party and we had to overcome those challenges that we were confronted with that we brought into the party in order for the organization to stay in solidarity and to be able to focus and do the work together. So there were limitations that we all had that we had to deal with. And we had run together and when we had discussions around those issues, we seen things that, were, that we were concerned with that may cause problems or destroy the party or what have you. We would have to have discussions around those issues, which we call criticism and self-criticism in the net context. There was chauvinism in the party where there were men, young men, young brothers who didn't want to work under or take orders from the sisters in the party. So we had to have those who didn't want to do that had to work under a sister to learn to respect and take orders. We also had concerns with issues in the party of the women taking care of the babies. So we had, and, and having to do most of the clerical work and, at the same time and help bail Panthers out when they were being arrested and all those other things. So it be, we had to have discussions where the children in the Black Panther Party were all about children and all about responsibility. So you had Panther brothers who had to change diapers, who had to take care of the babies. You had Panther bro brothers who had to do typing and typing and wash dishes and do all the other things that were responsible for whatever collective they lived in or when they came to the central headquarters. So it became a collective responsibility, not necessarily he or she responsibility. So there were small things that we had to deal with before they grew into bigger things in that context of the party being able to grow and develop. Koyo, uh, I, you just confirmed that uh, you know where the Q&A is. Uh, are, do any of these questions here strike you or do any of these questions uh, that the students are submitting here, is there one that you want to ask? Um, I saw Fiona's. Um, it was, oh, what was the reaction in the Black Panther Party to the FBI naming you number one security threat to the U.S.? Um, and then there was also another like sub like question, but like related to it was um, they were they were like, was this uh, almost like was that almost a slap um, in the face after all the hard work you've done to protect the community? Well, because the fact to here you had a black organization who everything we did was in the context of the law. We, we dealt with the Second Amendment of the Constitution was the right to bear arms and defend ourselves. Not in the context of what you, the craziness that you see today. None like that at all, period. But because of that, here you have black young men and women exercising their right. Then institutional racism comes into play. Then they want to put out this whole alert that this is some kind of insane stuff, that these, these are insane folks or what have you in, in that context. And so, that's you have. That's what you have. The FBI called COINTELPRO, the Counterintelligence Program. That was for COINTELPRO, the, uh, the acronym for Co Counterintelligence Program, where they used. They spent over twenty million dollars or more to destroy and discredit the Black Panther Party by any means necessary. You have a former FBI agent named Swearinger, who was a part of who testified to this, that he that. And it was in a, a part of it was in the documentary uh, that uh, Stanley Nelson did, Vanguard of the Revolution on the Black Panther Party, where Swearinger acknowledged that they had a unit within the FBI called Racial Matters, where you had to dislike and hate blacks to be a part of that unit. What you also have, you had those sending poison pen letters to those vendors when I talked about people in stores supporting us 
and giving us food for the breakfast program, sending them fake, sending them letters on fake stationery that look like real Panther, Black Panther stationery, threatening those stores, tell them that we demanding more money, all kinds of things to, to psychologically fear, put fear into them. They were doing all this. This were things that they acknowledged that they were doing and even much, much greater th evil than that, that were taking place. They call the breakfast school, the breakfast for school kids, the number one threat to the internal security of the United States. Because why? The United, we was feeding more hungry children than the United States government was at that time. And we were pointing out that contradiction. We just pointing out that reality that exists. That's the reason why, because of that breakfast program, young people who families couldn't afford had to make the choice to keep a roof over their head, to pay the rent, or to pay the gas bill, or what have you, to keep to keep the house warm, or buy breakfast in the morning, and possibly not have heat, get ill, the kids get ill, get sick. All those kinds of things come into the breakfast program being what it was and how it served that interest to relieve those parents of those that at least that minimum concern with the children going to school nourished, not were not stressed because they can't eat in the morning before they go to school. All those that's what play in and the very fact that how the community across the country identified with the program. And you also had then the treasurer of the state of, of, uh, of, of the state of California named Jesse Unruh, who said the Black Panther Party was feeding more hundred children than the United States government. So when you, and we, and we, and we point, and we're standing up for our, not just our civil rights, but our human rights and articulating that to the community, then you become a public enemy, number one. If I could add on to that question, um, was that $20 million that they spent, was that like tax dollars that you paid in your taxes? Absolutely. All that money is tax dollars. When, you, when you're talking about the money allocated to the different agencies, government agencies of the United States, that's the money that taxpayers in the country pay into the, into, out of taxes, yes. Unless they blackmail some other country, one of the public countries that they control and, and, get, and got billions of dollars from them. We wanted to be sure to ask about your creative process, how your ideas become art. Gabby, I know you said that you had a question you wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we can see that your art deals with many controversial topics, I would say. Do you think you try to implicate the, like a backstory into it, um, like through your art? Well, yes, well, the art that I do that's provocative is meant to be provocative and, and bring, to br bring attention to it. And when it's provocative, understanding that you have to be able to back up what you say in your art. So you have to be informed and enlightened about the issues in the context of course, there may be folks who may want to challenge you on what you say. And what I say in my art is, is a um, communicate, I'm communi communi communicating a language. I'm reflecting on the reality that exists. I'm interpreting that through my art. I'm, feel, I'm feeling the concerns and of the community and those expressions are coming out in the way I do it in my artwork. Sometimes it's more provocative than others. Sometimes it may aesthetically beautiful and humbling and loving and compassionate. Other times it may be more, more provocative than others. It depends on what the issue is, but it's still trying to, it's still meant to be, uh, you still have to know, communicate, and be under and be have some insight into what you're communicating through your art, because it's a language. 
It's a visual language. Art is. You see it every day of your awoken lives as we walk around 365 days a year, 24 hours a day as we awoke. If somebody's woke, you see some kind of where this art of some form, shape, you're going to see art. But so therefore, it has a great impact. So in the context of what the work that I was doing in the context of the Black Panther Party was meant to be in the spirit of resistance, of enlightening, informing, and education. Amazing. Zuria, I know that you had a follow-up question. Okay. Um, I, uh, I like what Gabby's question was, and I like the response. Um, what can you... Uh, were there any like Muslims or anything that involved Islam in the Black Panthers? Uh, well, yes, we could, in the Black Panther Party, you had, uh, in particular on the East Coast, in New York, you had a lot of sisters and brothers who were Muslim. But in the Black Panther Party, we had transcended the whatever beliefs, a spiritual belief that those who were in the Black Party came into the party with. You had some who were Muslim, you had some who were Christian, some were Rasta, some were Buddha, some just didn't believe in anything. But we, we, we made, we came together in spite of our personal beliefs, put them to the side and worked for the greater cause of everyone, of humanity in that, in that sense. You see, as the Black Panther Party, because the fact that uh, we respected everyone's belief system, but as an organization, we, we came together in the context of, of overcoming the challenges that we were all confronted with as human beings living in the uh, in oppressed conditions in society. Working with all these different types of, of groups of people, you know, I had a, a really great question come in here in the Q&A uh, from Malia. Uh, did you meet, did you work with any special uh, needs kids? Oh, absolutely. I mean, well, we, we, had, we had kids who were absolutely, we even had Panthers who were uh, uh, paralegic, came in the, who had became paralegic in the party. And you see the streets that you see with all the, when the where you have all these laws that made, came into being as relationship to, for the handicapped for to have access to handicap for the bathrooms, for the on the on the streets, all those things. Well, we had, we held rallies with the Center for Independent Living in Oakland, in Berkeley, uh, around those issues to get those laws passed. We had a brother named Brad Lomax who was uh, a parent who was handicapped, who was our representative, in in working with the Center for Independent uh, Living back in the day to help get those laws passed that are now national laws all over the country. Um, this is like a question to build off of Malia's question. Um, but like, since there was all these types of people in the Black Panthers about like whether religion or like who you were as a person, like how were these all intermixed and how did everyone um, uh, connect to each other to form one like group to be able to inspire people and make change? Well, we, we were invited by principles, universal principles, our 10 point platforming, what we wanted and what we believe, the quality of life issues. And those were the guiding principles of the Black Panther Party for everyone who came into the Black Panther Party. And I'm quite sure, you, I'm quite sure many of you may have read those, uh, those, those uh, issues, like we want, uh, we want freedom to power the term of, term of our uh, of the, of our of our of our destiny of our black community, we want free, we want full employment for our people. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. All these were part of the ten point platform and program of the Black Panther Party. Now I just read off three of them to you, so you can see these were the guiding principles. These were the uniting issues that, in regards to what your your faith or your you, was, that you were committed because we were confronted with the same, irregardless of what our religious belief was, we were still confronted by the same system 
that was uh, 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 oppressing you was also oppressing me. You see, so it was a commonality of concern, and and it grew, and it grew. It had to grow, it had to grow because you you know you you just didn't come together, and all the way it was just flowers and roses. You had it had it had to be something that you had to work through. You had issues. You had real issues that you had to work through, personalities, petty stuff, all kinds of stuff that you had to deal with. That made you more stronger and cleanse out and have this mutual respect as much as humanly possible. Nothing was absolute, but it was relative. Um, a question that I have is I I really like what Zuri said, like her question and how Black Panther is filled with a lot of different religions and how they can all just come together and agree. Um, and a question that I have is what was your thought process, like what was in your head when you were making um, your paintings? Yeah, what was your creative process? Well, uh, it depends on what it was that I w w was working on. So it could have been about the police abuse. It could have been about un housing and conditions. It could have been about uh, homelessness, all that, and how the people are feeling and listening to them when we go to rallies uh, uh, in the community and, and observe and reading different books about those issues. And all of that is what comes into the art itself is how you, I began to interpret that and express it in the work that I was doing and continue to do. It's love for the people, unconditional love for the people. Douglas, so then for the next question is, how does art convey or speak to you? Well, art speaks to me, it's a visual interpretation. And so that's the way art speaks to me. It, I mean, it, it tests you. It, art is something that if, if, it, if, you, if you're inspired by it, then you can maybe, and the words that you hear that inspire you to create the art is an abstraction that you can't see, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't taste it. But when you start to feel it, you feel you touch it, then you freeze it in your mind. And then you can begin to work to make it become a visual expression, a visual language. And that's when it becomes a greater, uh, uh, you know, that's when you begin to communicate. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And, and uh, Gabby, I just want to make sure that you get your, your question in next. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually had another question. When you were younger, did you ever have any aspirations to become a graphic artist or anything similar to that? When I was younger, did I have the aspiration to become an artist? Is that what I, I kind of cracked up? That's what I'm. Yeah. Uh, when I was younger, I was just like all many youngsters out there being bad, not doing too much of anything, but I, but just drawing, nothing, nothing political, just landscape art, what have you. Could have been, you know, to myself, you know, it wasn't political art, it was social justice art. And so, but uh, as I went to, uh, when I got involved with the Black Arts Movement, which was a, 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 all across the country, dealing with self-identity, self-pride and what have you, then that's the beginning I began to begin to do artwork that had more meaning to it and in and, and relationship to when I began to get involved with the Black Panther Party, yes. But as a youngster, I, I was no, I was not doing any uh, any political art that I knew of. Maybe okay. I was thinking about it, but just no, didn't know how to express it. Did your view change at all from, like, on art from when you joined the Black Panther Party to now? Well, no, because the work that you seen that I presented earlier was the work that I do now. It has the spirit of what I was doing then because 
some people have looked at the work that I did 50 years ago and say, you just tweaking it and it'd be just like today. As much as things change, some things stay the same. You see, so that's, therefore we still have ongoing challenges that we're confronted with that you, the young people, and now I have to carry carry forward with. You know, you have to be in spirit and to be inspired by it. You know, I actually think that'd be a great transition over into our final um, topic, which is in regards to broader impact. Uh, I actually saw uh, that Marco Fernandez Acuna asked a great question. Uh, I'd like to know what Mr. Douglas would encourage uh, young people to do to get involved now. Well, you are you asking me, or are you saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. You and, and actually, I'd love to hear from the students as well. Okay. Well, I, I would. Uh, I have a. I, I'm not sure if I shared it with you, but I can. I have a, like a political manifesto. That can be a guide that's a guide that I've shared with many uh, different art groups and what have you that uh, can how people can give thought to it's food for thought to be getting involved. It says, don't be fooled by deception. Don't be deceitful or, or corruptible. No, no, you get more truth from the artist than you have from bureaucrats. Recognize that art is a powerful tool and a language that can be used to enlighten, inform, a guide to action. Five, create art that recognizes the oppression of others and, the, and considers basic quality of life concerns and basic human rights issues. Number six, create art of social concern that even a child can understand. I got a few more. Seven, the goal should always be to make the message clear. Number eight, make an effort not to create political art or social justice art dealing with social issues just because it's a fun thing to do. You can have fun doing it, but don't do it just because it's a fun thing to do. Number nine, Create art that challenges the colonization of the imagination, our mental bondage or habits that we're stuck in. And, and last, number 10, self-evaluate one's work and be open to constructive evaluations from others. Be open to making adjustments if you choose to do so and be prepared if necessary to defend and explain what you communicate through your art. So those are the basic uh, manifesto, which I'm happy to share with you by email. And you can share with anyone who wishes to look at it and have some suggestions on in, in improving it or adding on to it or what have you. Amazing. And uh, Zuri, uh, I know that you're up next. I want to make sure that you uh, ask uh, your question. Um. Okay, uh, um, how did you feel to be targeted by the, by the government or the FBI? Because the government and the FBI were so against uh, the Black Panther Party. How did you feel to be targeted and to be a victim? Well, uh, we, looked at, we looked at ourselves as being tar targeted. We, didn't, we, in the context of uh, being victimized, yes, we were being victimized, absolutely. But uh, we knew that something was happening, but we didn't know what it was initially. But we didn't know what it was called. Uh, but we knew that they, we, we were being, we were concerned. You always concerned. And as it escalated, you become more aware. Then you had some people who just want, couldn't take it anymore, had to decide to go on life's journey in another direction. Or what have you, so you have it. It, it played a, a great, imp, it, a great. It had an impact on exploiting our internal coming together in the context of because because we were a youth movement. You have to understand this was a youth movement. The average age when it started was from. 
15, 16, 17, 18 years of age. When I got involved, I was 21 going on 22. I think you and Newton was 23. And Bobby Sell, Elder Cleaver, and the big, Elder Big Man Howard were the old folks in the party. They were 28, 29, 30 years of age. So this was a youth movement. And when you're in the youth movement, you, you do a lot of things that you have to grow to overcome if you, in, 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 in the context of developing a kind of, you have to go through all the, 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 the horror chambers and, and the alleyways and, cut, and see light at the end of the tunnel in the context of overcoming the obstacles. And they exploit those limitations. They exploit all that to the extreme. And, and, and so that means when it's played to the extreme, that means they try to pit each other against each other. All those things happen within the organization that you have to overcome. But when you get your documents, like we got documents that show all these things that different people have, like COINTELPRO documents. That means where they show what they were doing. And when you, and sometimes you get them, they're all marked out. They don't tell you what's, what you can see. You can't see all information, in, but you kind of know what was going on. Yeah, during that time. Then you have to request, I mean, you have pamphlets who went to, Geronimo Jijaga Pratt was a pamphlet who went to jail for over tw close to 27 years uh, for a crime he did not commit. And it was found out that he did not commit it. And that's the reason why he was able to get out of prison. That's, you, you, all those kinds of things were, were happening. In, uh, in the name of the Black Panther Party. The same thing they're doing on a, in South America, in the Middle East, same thing they would do in Africa, same thing they were doing on a domestic level to the Black Panther Party. How you, what, you, when you talk about the uh, FBI and COINTELPRO, Look at Black Lives Matter, how they're trying to make labor Black Lives Matter as a terrorist organization. That's to put fear so that you won't go through the work that they have been doing. That's transcending color and solidarity. A whole dynamics, a whole nother, another thing of community, grassroots people coming together. So when you, talk, when you talk about the FBI, you look at it in the past, but it still exists in the context of the language and how they attack those who are being achieving success in the movement today. Um, a question that I have is how do you feel, how do you feel about how far that we've gotten since then? And how do you think that the youth could do better as a whole? Oh, you, uh, well, uh, again, as much as things change, some things tend to shine, but it come amazing. Uh, at your age, at, uh, we wouldn't, I, I don't think as uh, we had the kind of vision and insight and intellect that you, you guys have today at your age and what you're doing. I mean, you, 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 you're very, uh, very enlightened in, in your peers and informed and, and can communicate and what have you. And uh, I think that, um, um, uh, of course, the issues today uh, we have to, you have to deal with are dynamically becoming more e extreme in many ways. Uh, you have uh, the, like I say, you got the global warming concerns and issues. You still got the institutional racism that you have to deal with that still exists today. You still got the uh, these groups that they they then that people thought had disappeared, the Klan. Now certain ties address their judges and lawyers and on the bitches and all these things exist more so. So you you got a whole lot of dynamics today, but you can't let those separate you know, from coming together for a commonality to overcome the challenges that we we, we may. We ha you have as young people, you know, because you, you're going to deal with the real world. You have to deal with the real world. Like we used to say with our kids in, 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 in school, and we tried, and they say, well, uh, they would come to and they say they were incorrigible. 
We said, well, all you had to do is show them tender love and care. And that's what we tried to do. Because we knew when they got 18, 19, 20 years of age, they're going to go into the real world. Yeah, and so you have to, you have to prepare for that. For that. And it's always, don't, don't lose your humanity, regardless of what it is. Your compassion and your love, your understanding. Yeah. Um, I had a question. It's related to today as like a build off question. Um, it was also kind of related. I don't know who, but there's an anonymous uh, attendee who did this. So it was kind of like this. Um, but uh, a question I would have is like, there's a lot of people that are starting to wear like the Black Panther, like designs or like shirts or like t-shirts or like necklaces. And like, how does that make you feel like knowing you had a big part in designing a lot of this artwork? Like, how does it make you feel that you went from like, or like a which the FBI naming you like the number one public enemy to like people like wearing all these stuff and like how proud they are to have been like in a place where the Black Panther started. Like, how does that make you feel? Well, if, if they, it's okay if they understand the meaning behind it, as opposed to just a fashion statement, which it comes to be in many cases without understanding the context of it, just like the picture of Che Guevara, the great revolutionary, Cuban revolutionary. I mean, it's everywhere, you know, over the years, you know. Some, a lot of people knew who Che and what Che and what he stood for represented. We were those who just wore it because it was a fascist state. So you would hope the people who wear, would wear it as a symbol of their solidarity in that context. Not just a a fascist state, because you know you have to understand the symbols. If you know the history of the symbol, then you know that there were Panthers who lost their lives for that cause. The symbol, Fred Hampton in Chicago, who was murdered in his sleep, drugs and murdered in his sleep by the Chicago police. There's a film called The Murder of Fred Hampton which tells you that whole story in the film. You can see some of it in the film. Uh, but also, so those dynamics you have to uh, look at as a panther when you would hope how people would understand the history behind the symbol. And you go all over the country with the same way. The symbol is comes from the South during the Civil Rights Movement in 1965 when the Voters' Rights Act was passed, you had young SNCC organizers, one of them, Stokely Carmichael, who went to Lyons County, Alabama, a, a county of at least 20,000. It, it was 80% black, but it was ran by the racists who were 20% of the county. They were those who, and the blacks who were also lived there were sharecroppers who couldn't read or write. But they had always wanted to vote, but had been threatened if they were to vote. Because, you know, not in the history of this country, blacks have been slaughtered and murdered just for writing, just wanting to vote. And so what happened is that they wanted to vote and they were determined. So they started the Freedom, the Lyons County Freedom Organization, which was a political organization like the white racists who ran the county had which theirs was, which they had, and they called theirs, they had a, a symbol called the uh, a rooster, called a white crop, the still for white supremacy. Now, then that was a the Democratic Party in Lyons County, Alabama at that time. And so what happened, the blacks didn't want to be a part of the Democratic process in Lyons County, nor did they want to be a part of the Republican part process in Lyons County. So they started the Lyons County Freedom Organization. And like the racists had a symbol, a white crop as their symbol to be to make them legal political organization. Well, they Lyons County Freedom Organization had to have the same. So you know how you have the sports teams, they have animals as their 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 mascots. Well, they seen the Panther and they chose the Panther as their mascot. So the symbol comes up from the South during the Civil Rights Movement in 1965. 
So it has a rich history behind it. More than just the fact of a fad or, or what have you. Now, if it's a symbol and you put some words with it, have relevancy with it, educate to liberate, serving the people, body and soul, those kinds of things, gives a little more relevancy to the symbol when people see that pamphlet. So then going back to when you said that uh, the Black Panther Party started off as a youth movement, mm -hmm. uh, as like a, a youth activist myself and a community organizer. Yes. Uh, what advice do you have for youth when it comes to activism and looking at the future ahead? Well, to, be in, to stay in spirit with the people, to be inspired by and stay in spirit with the people. Uh, yeah. And, and, and be informed and enlightened as much as you can. And have solidarity with with those like-minded folks who you see because we had we are with the uh, brown berets who were latino brothers and sisters you had the young lords who were puerto rican brothers and sisters in chicago and in, in new york the ey coon and the and and the uh and and red guard which we used to shoot pool with in chinatown in san francisco you had the racists who were racist young whites who didn't like blacks in Chicago, didn't want to have anything, who became our allies and called themselves the young patriots in Chicago. You see, so you got to have allies. And then you and then transcending the borders. You had black, a lot of people don't know there were Black Panther Party, official chapter of the Black Panther Party in New Zealand, the Polynesian Panthers. In 1971, they became an official chapter of the Black Panther Party. And you can see their documentary on YouTube called the Polynesian Panthers. It's in three parts. You had Panthers in, in, in New Zealand and Australia, the Australian Panthers. You had those who were inspired. And this is documented. And you see it if you go online, you can check it out. You also had the uh, Dalit Panthers who were inspired by the Panthers in India. You had Panthers in, in Palestine. And even inside of Israel, you had Panthers at that time as well. So this, this was a movement that inspired young people all over the world. I mean, we were invited all over the world. We've been every country. We've been to Korea, North Korea. We've been to v Vietnam. I mean, we went to Africa and to Asia. I mean, this, the we, we weren't the movement. We may have been a speck of dust in the broader movement, but we had an impact within that nucleus that impacted the, the, a, a broader movement, you see. So that, that's the understand, that's the thing to understand that they're you, allies, communication, how are you going to do that today in today's context? How are you going to communicate with folks and, 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 and allies and what have you? You know, then we had a newspaper, you know, but then mo it was y'all come out the womb knowing how to use your computers. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that's a whole nother dynamics today. <laughs> um, sorry for being the bad guy here, but, uh, we sadly we have to end this um, great discussion with Mr. Douglas. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today um, on the Tom Talks and a special thanks to Emery Douglas. Um, again, we would like to thank the Ender Brewer Middle School Family Engagement Team, uh, Sixth Grade Humanitarian Project, Oakland in the Middle, KDOL, and our host, Richie Nunez. See you next time.